Hi folks, Paul here and welcome back to episode 3 of our permanent shelter build. As you can see we've made a significant amount of progress since the last episode. Unfortunately due to weather and timing I just wasn't able to film as much of that process as I would have liked to. Um, but I figured today I would give you guys a quick look around at what I've achieved so far, the changes that have happened. As you can see there's quite a few. And then I'll show you in more detail about a couple of the things that really helped bring it all together. So we'll take a look at how I made the walls for instance and how I made the door. So with that being said I'm going to give you a quick tour of the place. Okay, so the front of the shelter, as you can see, has undergone quite a lot of change. Um, out of the, uh, the hours and hours I've put into the shelter, the, the making of the door and the, the making of the walls definitely took the longest. Um, I had to order a new tool, um, a scotch eyed auger. Some of you guys may be familiar with that. It's quite a popular bushcraft tool. And it's really good for boring into bits of wood and you can use it for making joints and holes. And um, I've never made a functioning hinged door before and so this was a first for me I was very proud of it I still am very proud of it um, and so that took a bit of time figuring out um, but it's a very simple door and later on in the video I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of how I made the hinges for this door So the hinges are quite simple and uh, like I say we'll go into making them in a minute. Um, but also you'll notice on the outside I've got this uh, this grey sort of wall here. Now this is what's known as daubs. The daub is a mixture of sort of sandy clay, water and typically some sort of dried vegetation. I use moss in this case because there's plenty of it around. Uh, you could also use bracken, that's another available option to me. Um, but typically hair was used, um, horse hair would be used quite frequently. But you kind of have to improvise with what you've got. And so the walls here are actually just sort of sticks that have been laid upright and um, secured with these cross rights here so they don't fall forward. And then I mix up this mixture of, uh, of wet sandy clay or daub as it's known and I start applying it to the wall. And uh, it dries fairly solid as you can see. It's still a wee bit wet just now because we've experienced quite a lot of rain recently. Um, but it makes for a really um, airtight good seal and uh, it's very easy to maintain as well is one of the things I like about it but it's also quite aesthetic it's a nice thing to use and um, it just makes the place feel a little bit more robust so I'll take you around and we'll have a look at the window next okay so the window is very uh, straightforward it's essentially just a, a stick coming out with uh, two sticks supporting it and unfortunately this um, for those of you that have been following on Facebook I arrived this morning and uh, this had suffered a bit of damage because of the rain. This originally had some of that clay daub stuff on it as well. Um, and so it was um, daubed all the way up and all the way down. But unfortunately because that's a sort of sandy clay mixture, um, as well as drying out, it will also absor absorb moisture. And that then makes it very um, sort of muddy and very wet. And so what I think happened is because we've experienced a lot of rain over these past few days um, it got so wet that it just started falling through the holes in between the bits of wood here that are supporting it. So all I did was just get some, some trusty old moss and start covering that back up. As you can see the moss comes off in these really nice square sheets so it doesn't take long to, um, to cover this at all. But underneath here there are struts coming up the side of the window onto this arch on the front I just added a bit of bark just for decoration um, I would like to make this stand out a little bit more just to add to the aesthetic of it um, but for now I've just replaced it with moss to uh, just to give it the uh, the protection that it needs so the other nice thing about the window that I made here is I uh, managed to make like a little windowsill in here so um, as you'll see there's some some bark little tiles that kind of go along the inside of the shelter here and they offer me a little space to store all my important things like bones and bits and pieces um, but again just a nice sort of aesthetic thing and it'll be a nice place to sort of show off stuff that I've made and and allow stuff to uh, to cool down when I'm working inside the shelter so 
Um, I thought that was quite a nice little addition. It's important when you're making your Shetler that you make it kind of homely as well. You want it to, to look nice and feel nice so that when you're in it you, you enjoy being in it, you know. Um, and little details like this little shelf here are the sorts of things that make a huge difference when it comes to that. So just a little bark shelf. Um, quite nice. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the outside of the shelter here. Um, as you can see, the whole thing now has a very good layer of moss on it. And it goes all the way up to the top. Uh, it took me quite a while to figure out the best way of doing that, but I'll show you my method for that in a second. But as you can see, it's got one very nice thick layer all the way around. And there is a little smoke hole at the top there, as you can see, which is doing the trick at the moment. You'll also see steam coming off the moss around it. And this took quite a long time actually, but not as long as I was expecting it to, thankfully. And then you can see it goes out into the, uh, the doorway here, and it's also covered. But the trick for getting the moss up that high was to create one of these. And essentially what I was doing with this was sitting the moss on it upside down, and then with that I could kind of extend my reach, put it up to where I wanted it and then flip it onto the shutter. And that's essentially how I managed to uh, to get all those bits up there. Also on the outside you'll notice just a little bit of uh, decoration of the stones. Um, a couple of stumps that I found that I've been keeping our bits and pieces on. And then a little bench outside as well just for, for chilling out on. Okay, so the last thing to show you guys is the fireplace. Um, this is probably the most recent addition. Now that the outside is completely finished, um, bar patching up some holes, um, the shelter is still very patchy in terms of its moss cover. Although it looks very good on the outside, there's actually still quite a few gaps and stuff that I would like to go over and, and fill in. But it's good enough right now, and I decided that it was time to make the fire pit and uh, ignite the first fire. Now igniting the first fire is always a really kind of special moment for me when it comes to shelter building. It sort of signifies the end of the struggle and the start of the enjoyment um, in that the, the making of the shelter can be quite a challenge but um, when it's over and done with you can start making bits like furniture and stuff like that and really start to enjoy the process. The fire pit itself is really really important because I'm in a coniferous woodland and the ground here is obviously very dry in the shelter um, but even outside the shelter it's very peaty and um, there's lots of debris and um, if you have a, a fire on open open ground out here um, it will spread into the ground and start burning the ground itself and actually travel through the roots of the trees and um, that's how forest fires are typically started. Um, coniferous woodlands are very prone to that sort of thing. And so for the fire pit, um, I found a big stainless steel ring um, lying at the side of the road on my way in here. And I thought it would make a really good kind of uh, structural piece to keep everything together. Um, and then what I did was I, I dug up a load of sand and uh, filled it right up with sand. So there's probably about a foot of sand in there. Because um, I've dug down as well um, to clear the, the roots that are underneath. Um, so there's probably about a good sort of foot of sand in there and then it's surrounded with the rocks as well to kind of insulate the the heat from the, the steel ring and um, hopefully that will stop that from coming out but I wanted to make sure that the fireplace was as robust as it could be because it's such a hazard. Um, the reason my last camp got taken down was because someone came out here and started a fire and it did spread, you know, it started burning down the, the woodlands that we're in right now. Um, luckily it didn't catch really badly, but it's a real risk out here, and so the fireplace I wanted to make nice. I wanted to make it big because it's a big shelter, but I also wanted to make it robust, so... Um, it's been a pleasure to ignite the first fire with you guys and share in this experience. Typically it's something I do by myself and I really enjoy the moment, but it's nice to have you guys to, uh, to take along on the journey, so... With all that being said, the um, shelter tour is pretty much complete, there isn't anything else really to show you. But I figured, seeing as you guys have missed out on so much, I would go over a couple of bits and pieces just to show you how I did it. Um, 
We'll take a look at the, the really simple hinges I made and we'll also take a look at how I made the, uh, the clay walls as well and, uh, and how I do that. So um, let's go and get started on that. Okay, so I figured we'd take a, a quick look at um, how I made my hinges just because I know some people will be curious as to how I did it. Um, it meant ordering a new tool. Um, like I said at the beginning, it's a scotch eye auger and it's uh, quite common in bushcraft, just something I've never had the um, experience with. And so I went online and managed to pick myself one up. It comes in this nice uh, sort of canvas case and essentially what it is is a big, uh, a big bit for drilling holes into wood. Um, it's got a scotch eye on it which means you can uh, cut a handle for it, the handle goes in and that allows you to uh, to apply the leverage to drill down into the wood um, as opposed to a bit that might slot into a drill for instance um, this one is for use by hand okay so when it comes to using the scotch eye dogger one of the things I noticed that was really important was picking the right wood to use um, I made the mistake of trying to use just a piece of dead wood that had been lying around for a little while. It was a bit too soft and um, the scotch hide auger is really quite aggressive and so the wood needs to be still very stable for it to uh, to work its way through the wood without just tearing it all to bits, um, which is one of the, like I say, one of the mistakes I made. And so to make the door I actually have to go and find some um, dead standing uh, trees, spruce trees, um, but ones that were fresh enough that they were still solid. Um, they weren't showing any obvious signs of, of rotting or anything like that. Um, and I noticed that made a huge difference to the performance of the auger. So I'll uh, give you a quick demonstration on how I made the, uh, the holes. Okay, so... Like I say, you want a nice clean bit of wood. Uh, you don't want to be working near any knots because the, the wood is going to be more dense around knots and that's going to make it a little bit more tricky to get through. So you want a nice clean area like this here and again nice and living. It's got that nice fresh woody sound and um, the auger, my one came with a handle um, but quite often they don't so what you would do is just go out and find a, a branch that's approximately the right size but you would taper it so that as you try to push it through it gets stuck it won't go any further. And then what you do is you give it a tap and that kind of locks it in place. Um, you don't want this to be loose otherwise your, the force or, or the effort you're going to be putting into it is just going to be spinning the handle. You don't want it to spin, you want it to be solid. And then it's just a case of uh, picking your spot and starting to drill. Now this is actually I made the mistake of watching people on YouTube and thinking that this was actually quite an easy thing to do, but it turns out it's quite a physical uh, physical activity. So that little screw on the end of the auger is the first bit that bites in and then eventually the teeth of the auger the, on the wide part here start catching and that's when the hole starts being made. Now like I say, I'm no professional with this thing at all. Um, I'm a complete amateur actually as it happens because I've only used it a few times, but it's an incredible tool and then you can see you start working your way in. Though I find if you take it out, give the area clean if it's not biting as much as you would like it to and then go back in and then once you get it to bite you can kind of keep the momentum going.
okay and then when you're pretty much all the way through you can start sort of reversing it out it'll pull out any debris with it hopefully and then you should be left with a nice clean hole Okay, so the next step is to cut your um, piece for your hinge. It doesn't need to be very big. Okay, so then the next step is we're going to want to make a pin that will fit into the hole that we made using the uh, auger and the way we do that is, or the way I do that rather, is to use the auger as a sort of way of making a gauge. You can sort of guess the size you need or you can whittle a piece down to fit in the hole but I find if you do it this way then you get almost a perfect fit every time and all you have to do is take your auger, you're going to place it right in the middle and then start drilling into it and what we're looking to achieve is to get it into the wood far enough that the wider bits here start to bite and as they bite they're going to carve a little circle into this bit of wood and then that's going to act as our guide for how big we need to make our pin okay so it's just starting to touch the wood there I'll turn it a couple of times and then remove it and then hopefully it'll be visible for you guys there you can see that gives us quite a nice outline to follow so then the next step is to take our saw and then what we're going to do is try and saw into this piece of wood to about that depth you don't want to saw all the way through it we just want to saw to about the same depth as this as this circle we've just made and I find the easiest way of doing that and keeping it all straight, although it doesn't always work out that way, is just a saw. And then when you think you're at the desired depth, roll the, uh, the piece of wood away from you and then continue to saw. And then from there, hopefully you'll get a nice even line all the way around. doesn't need to be exact because you can whittle it down afterwards okay but that's pretty good there so then what we do next is take our knife you want a fairly solid knife a full tang thing ideally and then what we're going to start doing is removing all the excess wood around our pin that we're trying to create and we're using that line we made as a guide and all I'm doing is I'm sitting the knife right on the edge of that line using a little mallet and then all that extra wood should, uh, should come away My mallet's been sat out in the rain so it's gone very soft. You might need to saw it to kind of really finish it off if your saw's not gone in deep enough the first time round. And then you can see there it just popped off. So just do that all the way around. I'm going to find a more robust mallet. I tend to work in like a square first and then come round and go around all the edges. 
There you go, that's more like how it's supposed to go. Again, if it doesn't pop off because you've not sawed deep enough, just take your saw and go back into it. There you go, it'll pop off nicely. last piece and then you'll see we'll have a nice square here there you go now it's just about rounding out those corners so same thing take the knife just go around all your edges Okay, and then you can see we've pretty much got the peg made. But to get it nice and smooth, what I'm going to do is just use the knife to uh, round it all off. Just taking off any high ridges that are there. Being wary not to take too much off. And then you can see I need to take some off from this inner piece here. so. I'll place the knife down, or place the pin down, and use my knife and just carve down into it. Now your shavings might not pop off here, that's not a problem. Just make sure they're all the way to the base. And then when you've got kind of all the all the way around you can just carve those little excess bits off just by spinning your knife around a bit of wood. Just like so, and they'll come off nice and easy. And there we have it, so that's one pin ready to go. Now, the next step is to auger a hole into this section here. Okay, so there we have it. We've got one pin all nicely made. Um, I am rushing a little bit here because it's raining and my camera unfortunately isn't waterproof. So I would make this a bit neater if I had the time. But that's essentially all the pin is. And now this can go into the hole that we drilled earlier and hopefully our pin that we used the auger to create will, uh, will fit nicely. So just wedge it in, line it up, and then find something nice and robust to hit it with. Just making sure to keep it all straight.
and there we have it. There's pretty much one pin and hinge, all nicely made and ready to be used. I do find that if the ghost squint as you're hammering, in them, hammering them in, you can uh, get a stick and use it to just torque it round. Just like that. Um, they do sometimes kind of skew off a little bit and you want to make sure it's all nice and straight. Okay, there we have it. So there you can see the, the hinge and the pin and um, you can see the pin in here. I tend not to drill all the way through but if you wanted to sink it all the way in you would just drill all the way through and hammer it down and then cut off the excess on this side. You can see the hole there which is where the door would start to go through and to give you some reference as to what this actual piece is you can see it's exactly the same as this bit here. So the pin goes in and then you've got the hole here and this hole is where the door pin comes through now like I say unfortunately I don't have the time to show you that in full but this is essentially the mechanism that allows it allows it to work you just do exactly the same for the door as we did for the pin in terms of making the uh, pin the right diameter to fit inside it and then that allows the door to, uh, to swing freely Okay, so that's a quick look at how I uh, how I made the door. Um, like I say, essentially the piece we were replicating is this bit here, with the uh, pin going into it. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into making the full door. Hopefully, we'll be able to do that in a future episode. But next, I thought we would take a look at the uh, the daub that I used to kind of cover the walls. Um, I think it's a really really cool resource, one that's very underutilized and uh, very simple to do. So let me give you a quick look at how I put that together. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need is a nice big container. I've got this big yellow bucket here. I found this at the side of the road. If ever I see anything useful lying there, I'll always pick it up and take it to camp because I know I'll use it at some point. And if you see anything lying around that you think you can make use of that's just rubbish, then it makes sense to, uh, to take it. So a nice big bucket to start off with. Okay, and then the next thing you're going to want to find is a tree that's come over. Now here in um, this coniferous woodland, the only place I can really access sand and soil is when one of these big trees comes over and it exposes all the uh, soil and dirt underneath it. It pulls up all that top layer and exposes the uh, the lower layer where you've got your sand and your soil. This is where I tend to collect my sand from, so I'll collect some from the bottom of here. Okay, and then the next step is just to add a little bit of water, add it just a little bit at a time so you don't get a big puddle of mud, you want it just not too wet. Mix it up with your hands. Okay, and then you should be left with something that's roughly this consistency. Quite moist, but it's still solid enough that it holds together. If you find it's not holding together, you can add bits of moss in, and they'll help bind it all, but that's pretty much it. And then the next step is just to apply it. Okay, so when it comes to applying it, what I like to do is just grab a small handful, sort of flatten it with your hand and then apply it and then just sort of work in the edges and then from there you can kind of cover an entire wall like I've done here and it makes for a nice robust good looking and strong cover for your shelter and this can be maintained it can be patched up as you go along as time progresses 
one of my favourite ways to uh, to cover a shelter. Okay folks, well that's going to do it for today, I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch this and apologies it's quite rushed, like I say I'm battling the weather and time and all that sort of thing but I hope I've given you some idea of what it is I've been doing behind the scenes and how I've been able to put this all together. Um, in the next episodes we're going to start making furniture, we're going to work on beds and chairs and then uh, hopefully after that we'll start beautifying the outside as well. So thank you for joining me on this episode and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. All the best.